This is a special edition of the Transit Unplugged podcast, the world's leading transit executive podcast, where we bring you inside, in-depth interviews with the world's leaders in our industry. And today I'm very excited to bring you part two of our uh, Legacy Leaders podcast. This was an idea brought to me by my good pal, Paul Tolliver, who said, hey, I know we do 40 under 40. What about what about some of us guys and gals who've been around a while? And I thought that was a great idea. And this is part two of that. And we've got some great leaders with us, uh, led off by Grace Kronikin, who's the former FTA admi- uh, deputy administrator in all kinds of great positions in our industry. Grace, thanks so much for being with us today. Good morning. Nice to be here. And our pal, Mike Scanlon. Mike, uh, thank you for being on the podcast today. Hey, it's a pleasure, Paul. And uh, my co-author of the book, The Future of Public Transportation, Peter Varga. Peter, thanks for being on the podcast again today. You've been a recurrent guest and one of our best. You're welcome. And Paul Tolliver. Paul, again, thanks for your idea. It's a great idea. Uh, I'd love to get everybody together one time at a live event. That would be fun. But thanks for uh, thanks for at least getting us together right today over this webinar. You better hurry, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Well, let me kick it off with you, Paul. Um, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself and your background um, and, and what you're doing now? Um, briefly, it won't take too much time. Thanks again for being here. Um, I'm sorry, uh, I don't have a book with you, but maybe in the future. There you go. Um, I spent most of my uh, uh, career, uh, public career and adult career, uh, adult life in uh, the great Northwest, Seattle, Washington. Uh, I was uh, head of... Um, Seattle Metro, uh, back in the day when it was an independent uh, state created authority. And in the late nineties, it merged with King County government and uh, uh, in in Washington state and became at that point, Department of Transportation. And I was over the Department of Transportation, which had the uh, King County Metro as part of this operation. But uh, before that, I was uh, moved around a lot. And that's one of the tips I'll talk to a lot of future leaders about in order to, uh, one of the options is you have to move around a lot if you want to move up. So a guy who's moving around a lot, uh, I tell people kind of one step ahead of the sheriff, but uh, the reason was you had to, uh, if you wanted to move up and didn't want to wait around for 20 years, you had to relocate. Uh, So I started my career in Cincinnati, Ohio with the management firm, ATE Management Services, which has evolved into first transit at this point. So that's me in a nutshell. Thanks for letting me be here with you. Paul still has the ear of a lot of CEOs in our industry uh, and is a real influencer uh, and somebody who imparts wisdom kind of like as a mentor uh, from someone who's been around. Another another leader who has done that as well is Grace Kronikin. Grace, you've been uh, in our industry as a leader for many years at positions in the federal government and also locally. And I know a lot of people lean on you for your wisdom and input. Tell us a little about your background and um, and what you're doing now. Um, well, from a background point of view, um, my first job that's relevant to this was uh, as an intern in Neil Goldschmidt's office taking complaints on the transit mall. So as a kid, <laughs> I kind of got an introduction to the uh while I was going to school, I got an introduction to transit and I worked my way back to Washington, D.C. and was a presidential management intern at the department and then rotated over to the Hill and uh, was on the appropriation staff. So uh, doled out money to, uh, on behalf of the senator. Senator was the Senator Andrews. And I have moved around a lot. I followed Paul's advice in terms of just, you know, don't stick around too long in one place just to get enough done and then move on when you're inspired to do something else. I have not been solely in the transit industry. Um, I worked with APTA when I was a kid on the Hill uh, when they came to visit. And so I learned about a number of different transit properties and what they were doing. A lot of new starts were, we we call them new starts now, but they were coming to the Hill to get money to either fix up old systems or or start some some new systems. This was back in the late 70s. So I moved around a lot and I was the director of transportation for the city of poor or excuse me for the city of Seattle and I ran BART and before that I was with the I ran the Oregon Department of Transportation for five years so it was a primarily uh, in, uh, highways um, but there were other modes as well um, so I've gone back and forth between Washington DC and the west coast mostly Paul and for a while you were uh, deputy administrator of the federal transit administration for a few years Right. You'd already mentioned that, so I didn't bother. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was, yeah. I just I was to Gordon Linton. Um, it oh, was yeah. Gordon. He's great. 
Pena administration and uh, uh, in transit. And it was Bill Clinton's Clinton one, I believe they call it. So, yeah. OK, gotcha. That makes sense. Um, and where are you at now, Grace? Where have you settled down to? I live in uh, Portland, Oregon, and okay. I'm, I do a little bit of consulting for folks on both transit and road kind of projects. Mike Scanlon, tell us about uh, your background and career, illustrious as it is, and what you're doing now. Okay, Paul. Well, uh, I'm a native of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I started my transit career there in March of 1967. I was uh, the mail boy, and that's what they called them back in those days, uh, the mail boy. And I worked for 26 years uh, there, uh, ultimately becoming the uh, what, what is now the chief operating officer position. And I moved out to Briar County, Florida and ran Briar County Transit uh, as their chief executive for six years when I was recruited uh, to come out to the San Francisco Bay Area, where I still am. And uh, there I had really three jobs in one. I was the uh, general manager and chief executive officer of the San Mateo County Transit District, also the executive director of uh, Caltrain, which is a commuter rail service uh, from San Francisco down to uh, Silicon Valley, uh, and also for the uh, chief executive of the San Mateo County Transportation Authority, which was the trustee of a half set sales tax, and, and we did much broad, broad uh, transportation beyond just transit the highway interchanges and things of that nature. Um, I retired uh, from there uh, from full-time work in 2015. And uh, then uh, I am currently a consultant, an independent consultant. I have a couple of, uh, among uh, my clients, uh, Herzog, I think that uh, everybody knows is a very large uh, player, particularly in the commuter rail space, uh, and also transportation management services. Uh, and TMS is, uh, we're a, um, we provide service to large events all over the world. We're working to get ready for the next World Cup. We do golf tournaments. We move the uh, NBA. Uh, we do uh, a lot of work for FEMA in terms of evacuations, uh, any kind of uh, natural disasters or others. So uh, I I'm still chugging along here. And um and as of today, I still remember my name and a couple of things I did in the past. That's great. One of the things you didn't mention is your former past chair of APTA. So, I oh yes, I did that, that too. I, yeah, I was, yeah, and I'm still very active in APTA. I'm on the foundation board, and uh, uh, they keep you pretty busy once you volunteer for something at APTA. They uh, they keep you coming. Well, I'm looking forward to talking to both you and Grace about uh, the future of commuter rail uh, in just a moment uh, because I think that's a hot topic right now. Now on to uh, my good pal, co-author, and also former APTA chair, Peter Varga. Peter, tell us about your background and what you've done in the industry and what you're doing now. Thank you. I, well, I was born in the highlands of Ethiopia and Africa. So I'm an immigrant boy, you know, Hungarian parents. Um, we settled in New York City. I went to New York University, but my trans transit career really started as a cab driver in New York City, which I did for three years to put me through school. And then I moved out to California uh, doing various things, but I ended up as a bus driver at Santa Cruz Metro when my work as a, as a researcher ended and I needed a job real quick. Well, the, the irony was that I moved up in Santa Cruz Metro and was able to then become the general manager of a small transit system in Michigan, um, Muskegon Area Transit System. And then from there, I went to what was the Grand Rapids Area Transit Authority that eventually became the Rapid when I became the CEO. And I was the one who, who transferred with the mayors the power of a, a weak authority into a, a authority that could actually improve services. And we went from winning the small transit system award to, to the mid-sized transit system during the time that, that uh, I was there. Um, you, you talked about the, my, I was also a board chair. I followed after Scanlon because I learned a lot from those guys, but uh, I'm still on the board because I represent the legislative committee to the board. It's a very unusual position, but that keeps me engaged in all the legislative stuff for which I was well known at APTA. So uh, right now I'm retired. Um, I am a consultant. Primarily work for Init, advising them about the industry. I don't sell for them, but I help them with the industry 
interface and uh, they pay for me to go to all the conferences. So as a board member, it keeps me engaged. I also have other contracts, minor ones. I have transit systems with issues. And I'm at, you know, looking forward to just being semi-retired and involved as long as I'm still sharp. There you go. Well, I see you. Uh, I see the post. Uh, Peter and I are also Facebook friends. And he's he's on an APTA conference meeting call like every other day. So you're right when you say they keep you busy, Mike. Uh, I know they keep Peter busy because literally it seems like every two or three days you're on some two or three hour long call with them. Um, speaking of conferences, Paul Tolliver is going to, uh, hopefully be able to join us at our, uh, think transit conference, which is coming up this March down in Fort Worth and give some perspectives on the industry from his career. Paul, why don't you share with us, um, some of your perspectives about what, where the industry has come from and where you think it's going? Uh, what I, uh, feel is a mission for me today is kind of reminding all of our chief operating officers and our new CEOs that us. We still have a basic mission of providing service to a number of constituents. Uh, every day we get a bus out on the street, it comes back in and we start all over the next day. And it is still our job to make sure that happens. Uh, no matter what the new technology brings us, what the new thoughts bring us, the new funding mechanisms, we still have to make it happen. And I do a lot of advising and even consulting with um, in the operations arena these days, uh, given all the new technologies, helping some of these new executives and new managers figure out how to use these new technologies to make it happen. Whether it's the new ABL technologies, the new scheduling technologies, uh, and some of the newer technologies and how we provide uh, services. Uh, um, you know, moving all the way to auto automatic automated vehicles. Uh, all of the new ways of communicating, cash is fair systems. All of these are still supposed to help us provide a quality service, especially to those who have no other means of mobility uh, other than the public transit system. They still are a priority. And a lot of our move, movement today in that arena of providing service is rethinking the issue of equity, uh, who gets what service, who gets how much service, and circling back to the basics, uh, let us look at the needs in terms of who, who gets it versus some other criteria that we have maybe in the past drifted into uh, the service. So looking at those communities, special communities, communities who have uh, not the means to uh, travel otherwise, but making sure they are indeed given the quality of service that they desire, deserve. And then uh, making sure that's high on the priority list. So those are the things that, you know, as we look to the future, I just wanna make sure that we don't forget our basic reason why we are here. Grace, I'd like to come to you next. As uh, in your career, you, you've had some very big positions, head up, heading up whole state departments of transportation, as well as, as we mentioned, uh, your work at the FTA. Um, the role of the federal government in public transportation has shifted over the years. Peter Varga wrote a chapter, as I mentioned, in our book, The Future of Public Transportation, all about UMTA. Remember that? And how it switched over, you know, to FTA and all that. It kind of gave a great historical perspective. So, Peter, I'm interested in your take on this question, too. But let me ask you, Grace, the role of the FTA under USDOT has changed from basically, you know, some regulation and a little capital funding to now really becoming the lifeblood for transit agencies during this COVID pandemic with the with the funding coming from Washington to replace the fair, fair, lost fare box uh, recovery. What do you think about the changing nature of that role and where do you think it's going uh, with our good friend Nuria Fernandez there? Uh, where do you think we're headed over the next few years? Well, I'd actually take you way back to the beginning and say that when UMTA started, Urban Mass Transit Administration is what UMTA stood for. When UMTA started up, um, I would say the intelligence about transit was actually at the federal government in terms of wh where they wanted to head. There was a lot of thinking about where they wanted to head. And the industry had gone from a private sector industry to a public sector industry. So in a lot of places, the, the, the jurisdiction that took over the private sector operation 
was just getting started, getting their feet on the ground. And it, sometimes right. it was the mayor and sometimes it was a couple of counties came together. And so there was a lot of, I'll call it fumbling around, trying to get it right. What worked in what, what jurisdictions. And there were Peter um, Rogoff is famous for saying, if you've seen one transit system, you've seen one transit system. <laughs> and, that's good, yeah. and that's, that's what the UMTA was trying to deal with. And, and I think it was a regulatory mode because it was trying in a regulatory mode because it was trying to make sure that the money was handled correctly and didn't nothing bad happened with the federal money. And so they were in more of a hold on tight to the money and you have to come in and justify yourself. And it, it's gone up and down and changed over time. But I think, if you will, the, the intelligence is quite high in the industry in terms of having a very professional industry that's out there. And the federal government, as you mentioned, as, uh, as part from going through many ups and downs right now, is putting some money in through the kind of the bailout, if you will, of, as a result of COVID. And so I think in the future, it's going to be up to the agencies to show what they can do. And as they're intelligence, if you will, and creativity uh, generate some new ideas. I think the federal government will probably be backing some of those ideas and testing them. We're in a very interesting phase because COVID has driven our, a lot of our ridership away, if you will. And um, the, the heyday was 2016. And we were worried about people being packed in so tight at BART uh, that you know, we could pe- trains were going by and people had to let them go by because they couldn't get on because there was no space. Right. So this is that's a lot of change in a short period of time. And I think we're going to have to let uh, the, the issue of congestion work its way out because our ridership, at least in the Bay Area, got built up uh, as congestion built up. Our transit ridership built up and now congestion is starting to rebuild itself and the transit ridership hasn't come back to parallel that. And I don't know if it will after COVID and the great resignation and people staying home and trying to work from home and all the changes in work. I think we're going to have to let that work its way through before we actually know what kind of services are out there. And then I'd go back to what Paul said. He started us off on a good note. Um, Our concern for equity and our concern for climate. I think both of those issues are going to help drive the transit industry and what it can do to help us solve the problems of the future. And I think as a country, we've decided that we're going to take on the equity issue and some of the injustices of the past in the transportation systems. It's not, it's, uh, but transit's a good solution for both equity and for uh, climate. And I think it'll be worked, as, it'll work its way through uh, the local planning that goes on. And I think the federal government will probably follow and do some experiments for a while and figure out what it can do to make the investment we've already put uh, into the systems pay off for our future problems. It's really good, Grace. You covered a lot of material there. Um, I agree with you. I think that, uh, and and I think one of the thoughts going through the industry is that during the COVID pandemic, two things happened at least. One was, trans- it was an inflection point. So transit boards, politicians had a chance to reevaluate what is our re you know reason the etra right what's our reason to exist and i think it it shifted during that time it shifted away from basically what you talked about grace the let's say nine to five commuter as the primary rider to uh policy objectives transit now can help us achieve policy objectives like equity and inclusion like a cleaner environment and i think it also shifted uh the Dynamic shifted from being what how you described early on in UMTA. Uh, so transit was primarily a local responsibility, right? The local city, the local board to becoming a national priority. Um, transit agencies really helped keep our economy going, Peter, during, during the pandemic. Uh, and even when we said, hey, nobody's allowed to ride except for essential workers, most cities stabilized around 50%, which meant ridership, which meant that half the people riding are the people that are making our economy turn, right? So the wheels and the bus that go round and round are are the same wheels that make our economy continue to turn. What are your thoughts on that, Peter, and on the role of transit going forward and the role of the federal government uh, in helping to shepherd that and guide that? Well, well, I agree with Grace that the, the, the shifting focus that's occurring regarding equity and environment are becoming important. Certainly, even as I left the transit system I worked for, they are thinking about those elements now and working on that at, at the route. Um, I think that, yes, the pandemic is going to cause the, the transit industry to rebalance itself and try to figure out how they're going to be able to do that now that they're recovering. And, I, and I'm not sure exactly where we're going to go with that. Some of that is going to be really interesting because the whole um, 
zero emission bus uh, in inflection that's going to occur from the federal transit system with all the money is going to really be very challenging. You know, what do, what do you do? You do you, how do you do charge management when it's really difficult? Or or do you move to clean CNG like the, the rapid is now trying to do because it's it's cleaner and it's not only uh, zero emission, but it's leading in a different direction. So you're gonna have a lot of that. Um, equity too is this is this is why I think that what's interesting is is this um, issue that's occurring at the same time. Transit systems are, the older leaders are retiring and the new people are coming in. And there's a new generation of transit leadership that has a lot of women and young people who are very keen on this, on this whole issue and who are learning as they're growing. And, um, you know, you've seen some, I mean, um, Carrie Butler moved to um, Louisville, right? And then Jill Barnett moved up and they're running this transit and they're new and they're really trying very hard to manage all this stuff. And they're dealing with, with a lot of sensitivity for people. I mean, that's, that's really, I mean, they're people, people, um, they have compassion for the customer, but they also have compassion for these other issues. And, and you're seeing it over and over again. On the other side, the federal transit administration under Nuria's leadership, and it was growing there with, Therese and Peter Rogoff and Carolyn Flowers and that view at the FTA that they're there to help is there. And you're seeing at a lot, lot greater level with Nuria though. I know personally for myself, because when, when I reach out to them, I get responses and, and I get some sort of um, push that says, yes, we should think about that or not, but they're really engaged. And so and they have a huge responsibility because a lot of money is going to be going up and it has to be done quickly and it has to be managed in a very forthright manner. And I think that that's going to happen. So the challenge is that, that all these elements are floating together, creating a new transit industry. And, and I'm sitting back and watching and marveling sometimes at how, how it's moving forward. Um, and then sometimes I worry that there's too many of all small sticks in the mud that are slowing it down, make you know. Yeah, I would worry about that. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, you know, um, there's a there's an old sto- an old saw or story about you know you hire this guy to come onto the ship to fix the engine. You heard that one right? And he goes down and taps the hammer in uh, one spot on the engine of the boat. And it starts the boat going again, and they couldn't get anybody to fix it except this guy who'd been around a long time, and he charged him ten thousand dollars. And they said. Look, you you were down there five minutes. Why should we pay you ten thousand? He said, "Well, it's five dollars for hitting. It's nine thousand nine hundred ninety-five dollars for knowing where to hit." And uh, I think that's why I want to have you guys on this show and gals is that um, you know you guys have been around long enough where you know the right places to hit to make things happen. And that's really what I want to ask you, Mike. Thank you, Peter, for that. Is um, where do we need to hit in order for commuter rail? Uh, to continue to grow and prosper. Like Grace said, you know, it was, and I used to run the Mark train service into Washington, D.C. I mean, we were, you know, packed out with uh, passengers and VRE into D.C. from the other end. We'd connect in the middle. And I know all around the country, you know, from BART where Grace was at to yours, Caltrain. I mean, prior to the pandemic, we, we couldn't run the trains fast enough. But now, during the pandemic, ridership dropped 95% on some of these routes, like Long Island Railroad or Metro North or whatever. Uh, and it's coming back very slowly because of what Grace talked about, you know, the, the great resignation and the hybrid work schedules that people are going into now. So what are your thoughts on that, Mike? What does the future of commuter rail hold for us based on their, your perspective? Well, um, all three of your guests have, have said things that prompt me to make all kinds of observations. But um, I think the first thing is, is that commuter rail or any other entity, we need to stop focusing on them as an end unto itself. And we need to use what what Paul said in his opening remarks, the word is mobility. And mobility, I attended a conference, uh, it was called the Fifth International Conference on Urban Transportation. It was held in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in September, 1971. Uh theme of that conference was mobility, the fifth freedom. It was a play on the State of the Union address of FDR uh, some 30 years prior, I think it was 1941, where he talked about the four freedoms. 
And I think we need to, in, in our industry, we need to embrace that mobility in every true sense. The, the analogy I often use is like a golfer. You have a golf bag of clubs, and all of those clubs are used for different situations. I always say the driver is the, the heavy rail, the BART type systems, New York City, you know, the big heavy systems. And it goes all the way down to, you know, you need your sand wedges and your short irons and your medium irons and your putter, which may be first and last mile and those sorts of things. And commuter rail is one very important uh, tool uh, in our trade. I think there will, the changes will be most profound there for the time being uh, because we're going to see a flattening of what was the traditional peak to base uh, ratio of demand for people to go to offices early in the morning and return late in the afternoon. Um, that is probably and may end up being flattened uh, for a long, long time because of the type of work that those people did and why they were commuting. Uh, now, that's something that many of us for years have been asking for. How can we flatten these peak to base ratio? Because we can make this a much more uh, manageable enterprise. You need fewer operators, you need fewer vehicles, you can spread the load over the the bigger part of the day. But I, I, I think that, you know, what I, I love uh, what Grace talked about uh, uh, the private companies. And uh, I came in uh, right after in Pittsburgh, where the the Pittsburgh Railways Company was bought out, and amalga- it was an amalgamation of the Pittsburgh Railways Company and 32 other independent companies. And uh, we were brand new. Uh, and the, the culture back then, you know, we talk about equity and diversity. The biggest change I've seen in my 50 plus years is when I arrived uh, in transit, first of all, we got our early grants from HUD. Uh, it was even pre UMTA. Uh, there wasn't any de- Department of Transportation and our early grants came from them. But the real, it was the people, the people in the business. When I came, we had 1,700 operators, give or take, two of which were female. I know both their names. I'm not going to bother you here. But they were left over from World War II when the men went to fight the war. Uh, the women were brought there. The executive team uh, and the management was white men and pretty, pretty much older white men, uh, you know, come to think of it, because the industry had, after all, been dying since the end of the uh, Second World War. The highest ranking person of color was an instructor. And I know his name. He later became my deputy when I became chief operating officer. Uh, so it was the boards were lily white. Uh, ironically, the equity in terms of service delivery, the services were being uh, provided uh, more to uh, minority uh, communities and people underprivileged uh, because that was that, uh, that private sector mentality on service delivery. But as soon as the federal money started coming in, the new systems weren't built there. They were built in other areas where more affluent people live. So it's been an extraordinary as I look back, you know, Peter just touched on it. When you look around the country right now, and you see people of color and females running the biggest systems we have. You know, just start thinking, you know, Stephanie Wiggins in L.A. and, um, uh, you know, um, Philadelphia, Leslie Richards, uh, got Deborah uh, up in uh, running uh, Denver. Uh, we have people of color. Uh, look at Chicago. You know, with Dorval. We have now a diverse group of people who see the world through a different lens. And what we need to do is grasp the fact, I guess the biggest, we need to embrace uncertainty to a degree and view things through the mobility lens where we want to remain relevant so that we make people move. Now, I have a lot of other thoughts, but I think I'm going on too long, so I'm going to just cut it right there for now and uh, come back later if you choose, or you can cut me off if you want. Paul, what are your thoughts on on that? Would you like to continue that conversation? Just a little bit, uh, like Mike Mike said, or uh, I won't call him uh, Michael Mike. But there are, I, I think, the whole issue of equity combined with the concept of mobility, just ways of helping people get to where they need to get to using now whatever it is that makes sense. 
But two, a lot of systems are really acting on that. And I'm the highlight one, my old system, King County Metro, I think they're doing some interesting things in Seattle right now. Yeah, Terry's as doing well great. As well as systems that I've been on in the South. Yes, the Deep South, uh, like New Orleans. New Orleans is rethinking this issue of equity in the sense that they have over the last 50 years or maybe 100 years in New Orleans, I really uh, highlighted the use of that wonderful streetcar system, St. Charles Streetcar. But that did not necessarily help the other 90% of the population uh, get to where they need to get to as well as it should have. And they're really looking at how to redesign that system now based on uh, elevating equity higher in the list of priorities uh, over what well, could be a financial issue to them, uh, issue of tourism and serving the tourists who hit that city. So I see that as a new way of thinking for the, this system. And I think some way that's going to impact a lot of other systems and their thought for future planning. So adding to what Mike said, I think that because you have these new leaders with a, looking at uh, life a little different, uh, I think you'll see more of that in the future. Grace, uh, what are your thoughts on all that? And I'm also interested in your thoughts on commuter transportation in general, commuter buses, commuter trains. We know that our motor coach companies rely a lot on that commuter bus work contracts, and they have been decimated during COVID. So any any comments you want to make on that would be helpful. Um, I, I I would go back to Mike's. I wouldn't, I hate to do reinforce that golf bag uh, metaphor yeah. there. But that's a good, that's yeah. a good analogy though. Yeah. I like it. I, I'm not really a golfer, so I don't know. But the concept of being a part of a bigger system and having a role that you play, and it may not be the only transit role that's out there. Certainly in the Bay Area, there's a lot of properties. They provide different systems, but uh, it's the problems that we face that we need to identify what are the problems we're going to serve. Paul mentioned equity. We want to reinforce that so that this micro mobility uh, systems and services that are coming up um, is is a big piece of what that uh, uh, equity issue is all about. And there are lots of people out there trying to figure out how to analyze neighborhoods and analyze communities and analyze regional areas to look at who's being served you know, by transit and what inequities we have to address. And if people are gonna, if there's those with cars and those without cars, maybe the transit providers provide a more micro system of some kind or reinforce someone else's micro provision of services or provision of micro services. <clears throat> and then the, the commuter rails, I would hold on to the right of way, even though there's only, you know, you have, it, it, it's gone from 90, you know, you said there was a 95% hit. I think a lot of the systems are back up to 30% and the yes. COVID's not over. Okay. Right. So let's wait and see what happens. And then as you go to make choices in the future, this, um, I think everyone gets the climate issue. We've had all sorts of natural disasters that have indicated that they're climate based. And we've done a lot in our industry to, to electrify BART was electric anyway. Most of BART is all electric. Um, but the buses that are being electrified, I, I think that from as a climate solution, more and more people are addressing it. It's not just a theory that's out there. We realize we have to do something different. And at least on the West Coast, we're taking it very seriously. Public actions are happening. Uh, legislation is passing. People are changing the requirements on themselves. Um, so you you want to hold from a commuter rail to, to go to your question. You want to hold on to that right of way and hold on to that service till we see what's happening and, and what people return to. Because there may be some that drove in the past that will take this commuter rail. Commuter rail is extremely effective. And if you have the last mile on either side uh, conveniently put together, you will keep those what I'll call choice riders. Um, and you, <clears throat> we're always going to be able to do a better job on on our equity provision. But I think that they serve a role in the future. And that driver that uh, Mike talked about, you need to hold on to the value of that uh, for a while. Yes, that's good. All right. Final round. Not really a lightning round, but I'm, I'm interested in your feedback, Peter. You can kick it off. You mentioned earlier the change in uh, leadership roles at a lot of transit agencies. And uh, some of the other folks mentioned that as well. What advice would you give to people moving up the ladder in the transit industry today and and uh, the new look of how our um, our boardrooms look, et cetera? Well, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm here as a consultant sometimes helping them deal with that issue about infra interface of the board or interface of the FTA because they, they, they are uncomfortable still 
in that role that they're working on. And I, you know, what I encourage them to do is is the the old thing about trust trust your feelings, Luke. You know that from the Star Wars. That if if your feelings tell you something, they're probably more correct than anything. And you should you should be guided by your inner strength. Uh, that's what I would tell them. Uh, the, the other thing is that uh, let's let's be patient with what's going on because surviving a pandemic and all these changes requires a certain amount of patience. And if you're pulling your hair out, you're not going to be successful in in leading the change and, and being part of that. So um, let's be mindful that this pandemic is is resorting. You know, like Mike said, flattening. There's flattening. There's there's right away issues. There's I, Grace mentioned right away. There's right away everywhere. I mean, the old bus routes were the streetcar lines. And when right. the streetcars disappeared, the, the buses were there. Well, what the buses are very important in those major corridors because all the development occurred there. So that's also a right away. So when you're talking about BRT, you have a right away. When you're talking about commuter rail, you have a right away. When you're talking about some of these elements, you have to look at that. Then then who's left out, as, as Paul meant, who's left out and how do you bring them to, to be part of the whole is, but are all those issues. And I, I encourage young leaders to look at this as an opportunity to reframe how public transportation goes and be leaders in it, you know, and, and take, take charge and get engaged and get involved, learn and hang out with some of our people who were in the industry for a long time so you can get some of that um, fortitude. You know, I mean, we we are a resilient bunch. Grace is, Mike is, Paul, we are resilient. I mean, we have survived lots of different things. I, I remember bad meeting that we had in San Francisco, Grace, and I was there and you handled it. Um, we are resilient people. Um, and we can help. That's the way I look at it. You know, we, have, right. we, have, we have some of that gravitas. That's really good, uh, good advice, Peter, and and a good point, which is why you're on the show today, is that you guys are the ones that have had that longevity and been able to adapt, like Paul said, move around if necessary, or uh, or just adjust. I know that, you know, part of my advice to leaders, having been in the industry for over 30 years, is uh, just realize that if you're a change agent, you're going to make enemies, <laughs> and uh, there there is people who there are people who have a vested interest in the status quo. And I always say, you know, it's almost like you hate to use this analogy, but it's almost like you have a ticking time bomb on your back. If you're coming in really as a change agent, you want to really make differences. Um, so you got to be aware of that. And you also need to be aware of who your real boss is. So I remember one job, I thought my boss was um, one person, but it turned out it wasn't that. It was somebody else who really held the power. And uh, and while I was trying to please the one person, the other person wasn't always so happy. And so that came back to bite me in the butt. So I think those are a couple of lessons from my perspective. Mike, what's a couple of lessons that you've learned over the years that you'd pass on to uh, up and coming leaders in the industry today? You know, first of all, I think I agree with what Peter said, but one exception is that, you know, I think this gang that's doing transit today, really, we, I take my hat off. They've been playing for the last two years without a playbook yeah. and handling this pandemic in all of our years. I mean, I can't think of anything that rises to, uh, to that level. And so I think they've done a great job, and I think they got to continue to embrace this uncertainty while creating the new future, a new future that's going to involve a heck of a lot more technology, more automation. We've got to, as a society, it takes a while to become enlightened, I've noticed. Uh, I'm still working on it, in fact. Uh, but one day, hopefully, uh, this nation will realize that you know some of the things we do today are almost barbaric. I mean, during this pandemic, I have observed people routinely driving in excess of 100 miles per hour uh, on on highways out here in, in California. And I don't know what's going on in all the rest of the country, but someday we ought to figure out that we, you know, one of the most, everybody likes to think they're a good driver. The sooner we can get automated vehicles on roads, the safer it will be for all of us. And the argument, ironically, is, are they safe? The automated. They're safer than what we're doing now. <laughs> and in the meantime, I think we ought to be finding the people so many dollars. We ought to have financial incentives uh, for people who use transit, not paying a fare. Maybe we ought to pay them to use transit. You know, I, free fare wasn't far enough for me. I'm a radical. You know, 
know, we got to pay everybody <laughs> that gets on a buck. I used to say that 30 years ago. And and take and, and make driving something, you know, vehicles could be, once automation is here, a vehicle doesn't even have to be oriented with a steering wheel. It can be a couple of seats in a small vehicle with uh, alternative uh, power and no fuel and creating a better future. And, you know, but it takes a while to get there. But you know, when I started back in the old days, you know, we still had uh, quite a few buildings in Pittsburgh that had uh, elevator operators sitting in their little seat and uh, taking us up and down floors. But I think we'll get there. Um, but I think to embrace the uncertainty and enjoy the ride, it would be dull if we knew exactly what was going to happen. A lot of people going around saying they know what the world's going to look like in 10 years. Yeah, right. Um, I don't know what it's going to look like uh, after after lunch. Yeah. But, um, I think that's good uh, advice, Mike, is that we are in uh, very changing times, right? The only constant has changed, yeah. like they say. I'm, I'm on a, a board of advisors for, at George Washington University for the transformative leadership and disruptive times. And we have speakers come in often and talk about how, you know, there's so many things happening in our economy, in our world that I'm not even aware of in these other industries, but we really are in disruptive times. And so I think you're right. We have to embrace it. Uh, but I agree with Peter that... Um, getting wisdom from people who've been there uh, as well can also help guide kind of the general outline of the, of the response. What do you think about that, Paul? What are your thoughts on where we're going and any advice you might have uh, to the current crop of CEOs, COOs, people in the C-suite of transit agencies who listen to this show? Good question. One of the things, remember, I kind of focus on the internal piece still, uh, meaning that I would work with that new leader kind of one-on-one and just go through some basic steps with them about being successful. And I just ask them a series of questions about what that means and hoping I get an answer like meeting your customers' expectations. And then they say, well, you know, what do you mean expectations? You know, that what is it your customer wants you to do? You have to understand a basic understanding of expectations because when the time comes for them to see if you met them, hopefully you were agreed from the beginning what they were. So they said you met them or didn't, because that could affect your career. Uh, and then I have to tell them oh, well, who the customers are. And right now I preach to them. I said, one, definitely the writer of your system, the passenger. We talk again about the taxpayer being a good customer. Then the board members or the policymakers are customers. Uh, your employees are customers. I tell them, and then I talk about a new customer called the media. They have a lot to do with your success. So I, I, I do that just so they understand that they have to juggle all these customers. One, they have to understand what they expected. Now you have to understand, juggle how you, uh, the CEO, are going to make meet as many of these expectations as possible. So you have to know what their expectations are. In other words, I preach that before you can meet those expectations, you have to have expectations. So basically sitting down with the CEO, my advice and making sure they understand what they are expected to achieve when they sit in this seat called the CEO seat. Uh, and then they're paid, uh, they don't pay, get paid peanuts for nothing. So they have to then figure out, you know, how they're going to achieve that. They got to hire people. They got to have a budget. They got to figure other plans out, how they're going to go from A to B. But it, you still start, starts with meeting and understanding those expectations of you uh, when you say, yes, I want that job. So that's what I do with them. I sit down with them and we just go through that and make sure they have a good understanding. Uh, so each day they sit down, they can come and see if they got there last night or not. And then and go forward from that point. That's great. Great advice. I think uh, having that information uh, kind of now, because we have good technology where a CEO can look at a tablet and see what's my current on-time performance, what's my you know preventable accident frequency rate from last week, uh, and so they can have that data at their fingertips when the board member or the media or the member of the public asks them. That's key to meeting those expectations. Grace will let you be the cleanup batter today. Bring us home from some for some good advice for uh, industry leaders today. I think given the pandemic we're in, and we were told that it's going to be a three-year pandemic. At least that's what I heard. So we're only into year two of a three-year pandemic. Hopefully it won't go that long. But um, I would say one is take risks. Um, and there's ways to mitigate uh, the the risk you're going to take. Uh, but 
I think the, as a leader in an agency, you got to take some risk. And some ways to do that is to do pilot projects. So you're trying to get your board to move and, yeah. and, and try something new. Well, let's it's just a pilot. If it doesn't work, let's call it a failure when we're all done. Let's give it a try. And that provides a lot of security to boards that they're not going down a path they're not that sure of. Um, so one is to take risks. Uh, two is um, move on and your career when you're there, um, you, when you come into a job, you got to figure out what you're going to try and do with that job. And when you've completed it, assuming you were allowed to complete your work, um, moving on is is an important thing. And whether you're moving up or whether you're a GM and you're moving around, you know, as a GM, um, you need to um, you need to be willing to move on. At least, sorry guys, but I think at least women and people of color. Uh, have there are ceilings out there. There were, I don't know if they're still there, but when, if some creep isn't going to let you move up because you're a female, which happened to me many times, you say, thank you very much. And you find somebody over here that wants your, what you have to offer to help you move up the org chart. And uh, as a, the third thing is your job is to help other people move up. The day you enter that job, whatever, you, whether you're an assistant, something or other, or you're the GM, um, you've got to help other people move up. And for me, w- women and people of color were someone, were people that, you know, you, you got to help all the way through. And there's been plenty of men I've mentored along and provided advice to, but <clears throat> society is kind of dished to un, uh, inappropriate dirt to females and people of color over the years. And I think we still need to kind of help people move up. And some of the things you can do from the, you know, as a GM, I had, um, interns shadow me. And some of the interns were, uh, you know, college students that were interested in the industry. And some were in our leadership academy at the department at, at BART. And one of the things I did is each each intern followed me for a day. Um, and they followed me into every meeting unless there was a personnel meeting scheduled that they couldn't be at. And they began to understand all of the things the person ahead of them or a couple of notches up the org chart has to face. And it gets in their head um, it's an education that you can't get out of a book, okay? And it gets in their head the variety of things. And what they said is, I just didn't understand that you had to worry about state legislation, that you had to worry about uh, the business owners over here, that you, you know, they they think of the uh, BART as the example, um, <clears throat> as the, the transit duties that were there. And they didn't realize the connection to the community other than the customers themselves. And so there's little things you can do for no money whatsoever. It's a little bit of your time to bring someone along and kind of coach them. And I think that you need to do that. And you can do that when, once you've got your first management job, you know, you can do that and you can bring people along. You don't wait till you're at the top. And so I would just encourage people to help each other. It, the other thing it does is it provides a network out there and uh, I've never been the smartest person in the room. So I've always had a lot of people to call on to, you know, answer the questions. And, you know, especially with technology, the, the, the newest employee is often the most skilled employee in terms of technology. And so when you go to solve problems, bring them into the problem solving allows them to see what what different people are worried about and what idiots they're working with and how big the problem is. But um, So I, I think you got to realize you're in a community to begin with, a community of problem solvers, and it takes all kinds to solve uh, problems. And so um, the, the last thing I would say is um, I've always approached my job as, as a, an orchestra leader and you need to have all sorts of different people. If you're going to go, when I had to, when I got to BART, uh, we had the Oscar Grant shooting. And if I hadn't had good people of color that were, had integrity in the community, when I had to go out and meet with them, I wouldn't have gotten half as far as having some people of color, black people with me as I went and talked to the people in the community to explain what we were going to try and do to correct the ship a little bit. And so in your orchestra, you need people that look different than you, that have different skills than you, that have different backgrounds than you. And you need to help those people get together and work together too, because they don't always see that. And once you start to get that churn going, you can serve anybody because you're listening to the whole community. So I think orchestra leader is another way to approach that job. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, thank you. Great, great analogies today. We got the golf bag and the orchestra leader and uh, and a lot more good wisdom from you all. Listen, it's been an honor to share this last 45 minutes with you all talking about our industry. Peter, Mike, uh, Grace, and Paul, thank you so much for joining us on Transit Unplugged and and uh, imparting your wisdom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Transit Unplugged In-Depth with the second 
of our Legacy Leaders episodes. Now, next week on Transit Unplugged News and Views, we have the first of several interviews that Paul did while he was at the UITP MENA conference in Dubai. We have Alexander Pazikanics, head of policy and partnerships at Via Nova. And that's not all. Paul was able to interview several transit leaders from across the Middle East and North Africa, including the CEO Roundtable, which was a hallmark event at the UITP MENA conference. As always, if you want to reach us, feel free to email us anytime at info at transitunplugged.com if you have questions, comments, or would even like to be a guest. So until next week, ride safe and ride happy.